Uh, so I guess I'm going to get started. I just want to make sure my audio is coming through, Nick. Good? Yep. All right, cool. So I'm talking about mind-bending rethinking web development and just a brief introduction to BEM and like why I think BEM is really powerful. Um, I've been a front-end developer for almost 15 years now, and when I first heard about BEM, I thought, I just kind of overlooked it. I thought it was an interesting methodology, but I didn't really see the benefits of it. And there's this constant thought as a developer that you look at your code a couple months back, and you're like, I'm such a better developer now than what I was back then. When I started adopting BEM into my process and development philosophy, I started looking at my code six months ago and was like, that code's still really good. I can reuse that. So by adopting BEM, it just allowed me to constantly be growing and finding reusable components. So it's kind of like my brief introduction to BEM, and it's one of my favorite topics to talk about. So we'll be diving uh, deep into it. And my Twitter handle's at the bottom. It's a nice transition, so follow me on Twitter. So it's a bunch of goofy stuff that I'm talking about. Uh, all right, so for those that don't know me, my name's Kevin Mack, and I like to say that I make things, and I love doing what I do. Um, I've been, as I said, a front-end developer. I've been focused on UX, hybrid applications, a lot of mobile development, and I've worked on over 30-plus responsive websites. So I have a lot of experience with working with large-scaling websites, big brands, and anything in between that. And I started web development in 95. So I've been doing front-end for a really, really long time, and I'm incredibly passionate about it. I'm also a co-organizer and co-founder of the Columbus Web Group. It's a user group in Columbus. We meet once a month and talk about methodologies, approaches, best practices of development, trying to educate people, get people smarter, and have fun. It's a really great group, so if you're not a part of it, find us on meetup.com. All right, diving into the actual presentation, the classic outline slide. And there's going to be five main topics that I'm kind of going to be covering here. So it's going to start with web development assumptions, an introduction to actually BEM, some coding examples related to BEM, uh, talking about project assets and how BEM can be applied to those, and then really benefits of BEM. But the benefits are really going to be trying to hit on them throughout the whole and, and just cover them at the end. So heading on web development, which is really what probably most of us do every single day. And I'm going to talk about three assumptions. There are a lot more assumptions associated with web development. But the first one that I'm going to talk about is the code is quality. So you open up a project, and you're imagining that the code is going to be quality. Everyone expects that. But you dive into it, and within a couple of minutes, you realize that, that code is not quality. And quality could be many different reasons. And I'm not just talking about like spaghetti code. I'm talking about how easy it is to update, so how modular it may be or how easily it is to look at it and know what it's actually doing. And as I'm talking about these assumptions, these are kind of flawed assumptions more than anything. Uh, so think of this as kind of a flawed assumption. So the code is quality. A lot of times when you're on projects, people ask you uh, to like just update that. I feel like on every single project that I do, there's someone that asks me that question because we have that assumption that the code is quality and it's easy for us to update it. And you'll also hear things like, it's, an e it's just a little change, it won't affect anything else. So you update one piece of code, and it looks really great on the home page, but you dive deep into an, like the about page, and you realize that you just changed something really major. So again, the quality of code isn't just the quality of code, it's how it's all related to each other. And that is one of like, the most upsetting things to me as like a developer and someone that's really passionate about front-end development is when I run into those situations, especially when I think that I'm adding quality code to the system, but then I'm actually causing big issues. And with that, um, the quality of code, maintenance, and scaling the content can be a horrible nightmare. As you look at not just from conception of a project to the first deliverable, but looking at something that you're doing multiple versions on, if that code is not quality, you're going to have a nightmare trying to update it. 
second assumption, which is um, nothing will change. And this is probably the worst assumption with the web. And it's actually the foundation of where BAM methodology came from. So BAM.info is the official site for BAM. And this is a quote from BAM.com. So it's they, they thought of it based off of the, the assumption that requirements will not change for websites. And there's that classic, classic workflow where a designer does a layout, developer starts doing front-end code, it's handed off to someone to integrate it. And throughout that process, we imagine it's going to be seamless and it's going to look exactly like how that image initially was designed in Photoshop. And really, that's not possible because that only really works well, that nothing will change if the only change is just content. And all of us know from working with projects, a lot more changes. So that's usually not happening. And websites really take on a life of their own. And they're constantly being developed and changed. And just gradual changes will happen. And I like to say that from concepts to deployment, websites change. And it's actually a really good thing, because you come up with new ideas. If we planned everything up front, and it was perfect from day one when we all met in a room and talked to a client and then finished on the last day nothing changed, that would be absolutely amazing. But it's not realistic. And even if it was realistic, I feel like we'd miss out on a lot of opportunities and growth that we have as an opportunity in the changing and looking at projects as they grow. So looking at you know this and how do we really deal with these ever-changing websites is to start thinking of your websites as creating sustainable systems that are flexible to really meet those ever-growing demands. And this is a big part of them. So as we dive into it, we'll definitely hit on this. And another uh, really great quote when talking about like websites is to stop thinking about designing pages or websites and start thinking about designing modules. So this is a great quote from Stephen Hennig. He says, we're not designing pages, we're designing a system of components. So don't think of it as a home page, think of it as a module or a component within the home page. And focus your whole development process on that individual piece and how it can come together. So break websites into modules. <clears throat> and another quote to kind of follow that up is uh, from Ben Callahan. He said, modularity is a requirement of maintainable systems. And I think this is one of the smartest quotes that I've ever come across. And I wish I would have seen this a long time ago because I would have been quoting it in every start of every project. And I, I like to think that when I do approach websites or projects, that hopefully someone will be thinking this way or this quote will actually be used. So start engraving that in your brain. The last assumption that I'm going to talk about is we know what that does. And this is where I'm actually going to get into the code and talk about those pieces of code. So we know what that does, which is very difficult to assume. So looking at this block of code, which is some CSS, it's a header, head select, selector. Can anyone guess what this is used for? What part of a website or which component? Header tag? Mm -hmm. Okay. What about these prop, uh, selectors and properties? How do you think I would use them? Two column layout with what? Yeah, with white background and some black text. That's in a circle, because that would be a really great interface. What about these guys? Like, what is 44.6782 of what? If you put them all together and look at the HTML, you can see that they're actually selectors for building on face. So we have that head, eyes, left, right. So the left and right were actually referring to this winking face, which is an open 
I mean, a dash and an O. And these two really start making sense when you put the CSS and the HTML together. So now you have the context of the two pieces coming together, and now we can see that eyes are actually relating to left, right, eyes, and head. There's a lot that's wrong with this, but it's kind of an extreme example, but we see this in our code all the time. A more common example would be doing something like this. So we have this classic container with a section, and then you could imagine like over the lifespan of a project, some developer gets in there and he doesn't know what to call the section, so he just calls it Kevin section. And he camel cases it. And then he puts some stuff in there, and then randomly there's a section of Bob's stuff that is a mixture of abbreviations, and there's an ID thrown in there because someone decided that was a good idea. One thing to call out with this, it doesn't look like one developer worked on this. It looks like it's at least three developers that jumped in there at three different times. And that's, to me, not really quality code. All code that's delivered should look like it's one developer, whether it's one person working on it or a team of 40. And then we look at this beautiful CSS, and we see some uh, really great uses of CSS3 selectors, like here at the bottom, first of type. And all these really beautiful classes and good use of... Uh, uh, of uh, looking at the senders. So question looking at this code and having the CSS right next to each other. The high world, what color is the word world? Purple. Any other guesses? What? I think I heard the right answer somewhere. Yeah, so red. Red is the correct answer here. But think about how long that even made... It took you guys to think about that answer and what red is. And all we're talking about is a simple span around an H1. And the majority of this is just unnecessary, just bloat and crap, when in reality it's just this container span. But it's not obvious if that red is related to that H1. So really don't do that stuff. It's really messy, and if you start seeing that, start talking about uh, better performance on your code as a whole in CSS and organizing, and hopefully you'll be bringing up them in discussions. So just really uh, continuing on that, we talk about selectors and about keeping them short. So um, when you have very exaggerated selectors, there are a lot of opportunities for things to go wrong. And by long, I mean something like this. So this is what I would refer to as a non-acceptable example of a CSS selector. So we have this, and then somewhere inside this, we have child, and then direct descendant of that is that, and another direct des descendant is something. So that's very exaggerated, and there's so many opportunities for us to go wrong. It's very similar to that red and how hard it is to decide what that is. So with that, it's really about reducing location dependency. And this is, you know, that namespacing. So that sidebar promo inside there, that container, spam, whatever that is. So trying to unmarry two pieces of selectors and letting that child selector be able to be ported and moved anywhere else. So it goes to the second point, which is make it portable. And related to this is don't be using elements inside selector names. So there's really no reason to have a dot button or a dot CTA or call to action or anything like that. Selector should be element agnostic and your CSS should uh, really shouldn't care what element you're applying to because it should be able to be portable anywhere across the site. With By doing this you're also decreasing specificity and really targeting about efficient CSS selectors. So longer selectors have higher specificity, and again, it has a high opportunity to go wrong, and they're really difficult to read and understand what's going on. Um, example of this is like that, uh, maybe a container with the greater than P, so it's that direct descendant and the absolute path to it. Those are very difficult to overcome. They're also very strong with the rendering of CSS. They seem to always win out all battles. Except, oh, the only thing that wins over it are CSS3 selectors. 
And that brings me to CSS3 selectors. So this quote's a little bit old, but uh, modern-day browsers actually have overcome this. So uh, for a long time, this was always a true statement. If you care about page performance, then you shouldn't be using CSS3 selectors. And we've relied on them as developers a little bit too much. And CSS3 selectors are really there to help but they shouldn't be there to support everything that you're doing. And um, a really good example of the like, overuse of CSS3 selectors are if you have uh, a touch device, so for example, like an iPhone, and I'm scrolling through the page, there's usually that nice like WebKit bouncing feel and flow, and the, it goes down and kind of eases as I'm scrolling through. With heavy CSS3 selectors or even bad performing CSS, it's going to have this kind of jagged like feel to it where it's not this seamless smooth. So even though desktop browsers have kind of overcome that and some of the more powerful tablets have, we're still seeing that on powerful devices like your, I don't know, brick iPhone, I mean Androids and your iPhone 5S. So still see that a lot in the wild. Last piece with selectors, and this is going to be heavily related to the discussion of BEM. Um, is a question for you guys. Is there a maximum length for class names in CSS? It is a yes, no question. So it's no. So by uh, length of selector names, I mean if it was something like, this is a really, really long name for a selector name, and it wasn't actually broken up as multiple selectors. So it's the actual class name itself. There is no limitation on it. Some of the really older browsers do, and that's like IE7, but even IE8 doesn't have a limit. So getting into BEM and kind of stop my rant on uh, CSS and page performance and some of the best practices stuff, and I talk just about that all day long. So who here has heard of BEM? Raise your hand. Cool. Uh, do you guys reuse BEM on your projects? <laughs> All right, so uh, it's a methodology, and with any methodology, it may be a hard topic to really grasp at first. And it's one of those things with more exposure and more frequent use, it will become second nature to you. And as I said, like at first, I was, I kind of, turn my back on it, and then I adopted it, and now it's the only way that I write my code. And it's actually turned into the way that I think about design and the way that I look at any object that may exist out there. Um, and we don't really talk about this later, so BEM was developed by Yandex, which is a Russian, com uh, Russian search engine company. They're similar to like a Google in the States and they develop a lot of internet-based services and products. They're the number one hit website in Russia, and they came up with this methodology because they have these huge long-term projects that are constantly being scaled. And BEM's been trickled into a lot of major applications and uh, projects in the United States, too. So this is the quote of what BEM is from BEMinfo.com. Uh, very long. Uh, BEM.info.com, again, is the official website, but it was originally in Russian, and then it was translated to English, and a lot of the translations give you really long run-on sentences that don't make that much sense. So if you're going to the documentation, the official documentation, you may be scratching your head here and there. So I'm going to try to summarize some of the pieces from it. So really, I, you can shorten it and say it's a methodology, that allows you to divide it, the interface into logical independent blocks. And that can allow you to create libraries of web components for fast, efficient web development. So it's a methodology for just really organizing your team that allows you to move quickly and interchangeably. Huge focus of it is actually reuse. So there's three main entities of BEM, which BEM stands for Block Element Modifier. And these three entities are enough to really define how you'll author uh, HTML, CSS, and structure your uh, DOM and all the components in your site. So these three alone are super powerful. 
first one I'm going to hit on is a block, and a block is a building block that holds content. So for those that aren't familiar with them, that may sound like a very ambiguous, open definition, but we'll go through examples of it. And there's actually two types of them. They're simple and compound blocks. So this is just something that's, just for lack of a better term, is like a container. Second part is element, and they're a part that performs a certain function. And they're context dependent, meaning that elements can only live inside of a block. So they are heavily related to the block. For lack of a better term, I guess, uh, they are children elements to the block, but not direct descendants. Modifier is a third piece, which is super powerful, and it's just an altered version, alternate version of a block or element. Very helpful because very frequently as you're building out classes and developing modules and components, you need to make a slight altered or variation to something. You can use a modifier to kind of extend that functionality of a previous uh, selector. The last two pieces in the related block are simple block and compound block. So starting with simple block, it contains only an element or elements. So that may sound confusing without knowing some code examples, but that's the definition of a simple block. Compound block contains only blocks and or other elements or elements. So this is a block that can contain another block and or elements. And again, elements are context dependent to its parent or grandfather, whatever it may be, block. So the three have a uh, naming convention, and it really follows this pattern with block. So a block looks like this. So it's a CSS selector. It's not an ID, and it can never be an ID. It's only a class. So it's a class dot whatever, but in this case, I'm going to stick with block. So this is my block name. Elements follow block name double underscore element. So you separate elements, or you identify elements as carrying down the context of what it's in, which is its block, and you separate it with a double underscore element. Modifiers are used by double dashes. So this is the main naming pattern. So you have double underscore for elements, and you have double dash for modifiers. There's three other potential ways that you can use modifiers, which you can have it on the block itself, you can have it on the element, you can have it on the block and element. You can actually have double modifiers too if you wanted to. But this is kind of an example of everything kind of put together. So this right here is really, really important. Um, if this is new to you, this is something that I hope by the end of going through the examples, you're absorbing and understanding how that pattern works. So it's really important to know there's block, block double underscore element, block double dash modifier, and those other variations of it. So really getting at a first example, uh, I'm going to show a graphic of a header. So here's this header. You can see this looks like a traditional header. Um, and we're going to go through this as if you know I was showing you a, a mock-up of the header. And as a team, we wanted to decide how this would be built. So as like a practice, not even talking about code, talking about how I can break this up into different modules and how that code could actually be written at the end. So here's my design. So what I'm going to call this, I'm going to start with the block of this, and it's going to be called header. <clears throat> so this whole module is referred to as header and it contains all these other pieces inside of it. Header contains actually three different elements, and this may be kind of hard to see, but this is highlighted in orange, this is highlighted in orange, and this is highlighted in orange. 
And the naming conventions for these are header logo, so header double underscore logo, header double underscore nav, header double underscore search form. So, so far we have this header block, and these are its three elements. <clears throat> Interesting thing about header is it's a compound block, because header nav and header search form are actually their own blocks. So again, a compound block is a block that contains either elements, which is the logo over there on the far left, or blocks, and or blocks. So there's two blocks here. I'm going to dive into header nav. So we look at this guy, and we realize that as a nav, we're probably going to wrap it as a nav element. So then what would be inside of that? Probably an unordered list. So we could call that header double underscore nav double underscore list. So as we're looking at this design, we're already kind of talking about the architecture of this structure. Inside that, we have some elements. So inside header nav list, we have uh, four different elements. which are referred to as header nav list item, separation of double underscores. I only did one error here, but it's actually these four. So about the, this area around here, 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 here are all elements of list item. I'm really afraid I'm going to trip over this, like, booby trap below me. Yeah. <laughs> so then... Uh, Looking at these guys, um, inside, we're going to have one little slight change. So, so far, we're following that breakdown of that block, so the outer header to its next block or the elements inside of it. This next example is going to be for the links. So, we have four links here. <laughs> I'm highlighting three of them. And I'm using header nav link instead of header nav list item link. And the reason why I decided to do header nav link as opposed to header nav list item link is the styling for these three guys, the about services and locations, if I wanted to use it elsewhere inside the header block, I now have the ability to do that. So header nav link is still part of the global block of header, but it allows me to move it anywhere inside of it. So it's still contextually based to header and specific to the header styling as a whole and the functionality of the header, but I could make it be outside of this list item. Example of that would be if you imagine that this had a secondary navigation underneath it, say it had like account settings or account login or some other kind of call to action at the bottom of it, I could then still use the same classes and the same functionality that's associated with it by being able to move it in two different places. If I didn't have that, I could actually keep it as header nav list item link, but for that example, I'm calling it out and making sure that it's kind of a known that you can move those, I decided to actually base this around how I would write this code. The fourth link you'll see that isn't highlighted, and that's because it's using the modifier. So we have the three uh, links that are header nav link, and then we have the last one that is header nav link double dash highlight, which the highlight adds additional styling to it, which is the all uppercase blue, and I think it's a little bit fatter of a weight. So you can see it highlighted there. So looking at this guy, we kind of went through all of them and how you would do like a naming convention before even cracking open a text editor or an IDE. It's really nice because you can actually um, start giving descriptions to pieces of the code or different elements in the design and start talking as a team before you have anything to develop. 
So an example of that, I mean, instead of saying, like, the link in the header or the link in this section, I can say, well, nav, uh, header nav link, header nav link modified or whatever it may be. So I can actually have specific names instead of being, like, it's in the header and it's an anchor and it's dive down deep. So we can actually talk about the list element here. We have a special name for it. So teams can really communicate uh, off the bat. So a huge point of BAM is to really uh, tell other developers more about a piece of markup and what it's doing just from its name alone. And that's a really great quote, and I don't know if you guys picked up on this. I use quotes all the time because uh, I always see something, and I'm always inspired by other people, and I want to use that. So in CSS Wizardry, that's a CSS uh, wizard.com. It's a really amazing blog. He's fun to follow on Twitter, too. So getting into code samples, I'm going to start with a classic button, because they're really easy to understand. So here, we have this basic button. Uh, we have this basic button, and it's completely vanilla. The only thing that's on this is a normalize and some reset stuff that I just have in any project that I use. So this is how it looks out of the box. That's just a button class. No additional styling. It's just bare bones vanilla. Inside here, um, oops. come on. I'm afraid if my computer froze. I know, it's a Mac. It can still happen. There we go. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right, cool. Sorry about the technical difficulties there. So you can see that's still that vanilla button. And I'm going to add a class called CTA or call to action. So now it brings in some of the basic styling of my project. Why this is really nice is I'm not off the bat going to my element and applying classes to it. I have the ability to go to its default vanilla settings if I want to. And by adding certain classes, I can start putting it in the form of my website. So if I add something like um, a modifier to this, like blue, you can see that it's kept the same form factor, but now we've added some additional functionality to it, which is nice. <clears throat> With this, I can uh, change it out to maybe another selector that I have, which was orange. It's still the same. The only thing that's changing that modification is the background color, and that's true for all of these. There's another one, blue light. And you can see at the bottom, the only real change is that background color from its reset. Very basic example of a modifier and a button. These are really nice to do when you're building out like a toolkit for a website and those individual components, especially if you're designing the browser. You may not know which design looks right until you see it, especially as designers, developers work very closely in there. It allows that flexibility to switch between different layouts and designs. This is my uh, uh, coding example, and it's a a four-part series called Human. I hope it makes sense at the end. So we have this block of code. Pretty basic. Highlighting on block again. Human. There's the human block. Inside human, we have its content and some of its elements. So we have human head, human trunk, human legs. So far, is everyone following at least the block to element breakdown? Uh, not necessarily. This is just... No. <laughs> no, that would be awesome if I did that, the whole body, but should have. So that ends part one of the human. Getting into part two refreshing on the block. 
can't stress how important at least block and element are. So again, we have the head, we have the body. We're going to add a couple more pieces of code in here. So this now makes human a compound block. Now we have some elements inside there, and human head is, is its own block now. We have the eyes. And inside human head eyes, we're going to add in the individual eyes. So again, you can see that it's breaking down from human head, human head eyes, human head eyes eyes. This is an extreme kind of level breakdown. And this is something that you can do. It's not necessarily best practices or goes against best practices. It depends on the architecture of your website. And if you actually really need that additional layer of selectors inside your element. Whole goal of this is so you can dive down deep into any element here and just be overriding and extending properties without having any properties be conflicting. Last piece is we're going to add in the legs, very similar to eyes, but it doesn't dive down that next deep layer. So we have legs, and we have legs, leg. We'll touch on that in a little bit later. If I don't answer that specifically, if you could ask at the end. Sure. But yeah, please remind me if I don't. All right, so we can now add modifiers to these, because maybe we want to identify right versus left. So the right leg maybe kicks, and the left leg is a bum leg. I have a minor call out here, though, that when you're developing classes as a whole and also modifiers, you don't really want them to be specific to the content. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later. This is more of just illustrating the purposes of BAM. So now we have the left leg and the right leg. So if we wanted to target styles for styles or functionality to the left or right, we can do that. I'm not sure if I clearly stated this earlier, but the selectors aren't necessarily just talking about CSS because it can be used for JavaScript or anything UX related because they're, again, just selectors and you can use them in any DOM structure. So the last piece is adding the modifiers to just the eyes. So now inside this whole structure, we can really target any level of this with ease. And if you were to see human, head, eyes, eyes, right, in a CSS file, you would know that it would be some kind of modified version of I, and it exists inside some kind of block that is the human and has head and eyes above it. So just that selector alone, I can kind of know where the context of where that rely, where it lies inside of a DOM structure. And there could be other pieces, like other additional wrappers, like around <laughs> the human eyes, eyes. There could be another div around there, or there could be a nav element around there. But it's not really important to the selector as a whole, because it doesn't come into play with the context of that element itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You could. There's different approaches, and I'm going to touch on that in a little bit. But you can always use like your base foundation, and then you can do like a, what I refer to as a helper class to extend those properties. And again, it goes into the, more of a discussion of architecture of your project and where those additional classes are going to be added. If it's on the render of the page versus if there's an interaction, you may want to have that ability to toggle off and on one of those helper classes or use that helper classes as some kind of 
additional selector or identifier? That's a good question. Human part three slash cow. This is where it gets really fun, at least in my head. All right, so we're going to take this human block and we're going to copy it. And we're just going to do a find and replace in the bottom one so it, human becomes cow. So anywhere it says human, we have cow now. So now we have two different modules. We have the human, we have the cow. So we could have specific styling, and you can see that there's a lot of similarities between them. But there's a huge difference between humans and cows, uh, among many other things. But a big one I'm calling out is just their legs. So instead of left legs, I'm going to make these be back and front. And then once this is done, you can see that we have a structure a lot of the same breakdown, but we kind of separated out cow and human into one example. Yeah, yes. Because, well, that's in the case that you would be wanting to do specific classes for each one. So, based off Kevin's point right there, we get into the final part of the human and cow. And this is really focused on making your code module and refactoring it. So it's a really quick example. If we look at human, we look at cow, and the project has now kind of grown to the point where we initially thought human and cow needed to be separated, but we realize in reality they don't need to be. So in this example, just doing a find and replace for human and making it what humans are, we're animals, and cows, cow the same thing, animal. So now we have this uh, two versions of the same thing, and the only variation is that we have legs having back and front, and we have right and left. So now we've made this to be more of a portable, reusable piece because the UI wasn't dependent on it being cow versus human. If we do decide that we want to focus on humans at that block level, we could add a modifier that's human. So we have animal double dash human. Maybe the head also wants to bring that down. I don't need to carry the, that modifier all the way through because that was just the same as doing uh, human. And the reason why I switched it to animal was to give the flexibility of sharing the same properties in classes. With this, and based off that question, we could add an animal and then use the animal human as a way to extend those properties. So maybe in this example, uh, animal doesn't have a background, but when it's human, it gets the background color red. We could also add in any modifiers anywhere within. So maybe there's a specific call or specific piece of functionality that's related to animal cow legs, we could do that. So the concept here is just looking at your code and going back to that idea of uh, nothing really changes. So in the beginning of this project, we may have thought that we were just doing a human, and then we've introduced a cow in the system, and then we realize, well, these are very similar structures, and in the case of this, it was a copy and paste. And it's maybe not always as clear as that, but going back and looking at your code and trying to make it and identify those modular pieces and be like, well, you know what, these are all sharing the same properties. They can actually be the same selectors. So going in there and then switching those cow and human over to animal allows for that flexibility and allows me to have just one class with some slight modifications inside there. Going back to our friend, the global header that we discussed earlier on, and now we're going to look at the code. So inside here, we have this header, which we talked about earlier. Crack it open, and you'll see the header logo, header nav, header search form, which even before opening this up, we discussed this, and maybe some of you were imagining how this code would be written. So the weird one that is probably a call-out is form. 
and we have header double underscore search form, where in some cases, as you were going through that naming exercises, you may have just called it like search. And the reason why I call it search form was just to give it more of a semantic look for form. There's also a talking point. So again, these are the elements. And the first one that we're going to look into is that header nav and the actual HTML that's associated with it. So there's that list element with the header nav list. Inside there, you'll see its elements of header nav list item. Inside there, it'll have the anchor inside there. And again, this header nav link isn't, doesn't necessarily have to live inside this list element. It can live anywhere inside of header nav. Well, these are module specific, it's not page specific. Well, that, that's true, but head and body are always constants. So, yeah, you wouldn't. Because then every single selector would begin with, yeah. And there's not really a case where that would ever happen. And now looking at the actual contact modified version, it's kind of there low at the bottom, but you can see that it has that highlight. Looking at form, we have a field set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, header could be potentially a div. Uh, cracking open the header search form. We see this new introduced block, which is field set, field set simple, which field set simple in this case is just a reset, which removes the basic uh, user agent styling, which is some padding margin and borders that come with field set. So I'm using that to kind of clean it up. Inside field set, you'll notice that there's a legend that isn't actually visible in the UI and a label that's not visible in the UI. So I actually have a block that's non-related to the header as a whole. It's its own separate block that's included inside header. So you can include other blocks that really are not dependent on being inside that block itself, which is this field set. But the, the elements of field set simple, which are this guy right here and this guy, and this, uh, these two guys are elements of this field set block. So those are not part of header, but they're able to be used inside of header itself. Underneath, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the inputs and the buttons, they are also part of the field set. Mm -hmm. But they're also part of the header search. Yep. Input. So would you ever see a or come in, or have a scenario where you'd want to call an input field set? Dash that or underscore underscore label and also for input and also call it header search. Yeah. Would, it, would you want that block or element? Yeah, you have a, you could have a single component that, that shares. Could be from two different yeah. Yep. Same yep. You can definitely do that. So just to reset that because that's a, a good question or comment is that you could have an element that has that comes from two different contexts and are combined. For example, this uh, header search input could be an element of field set. So it could have field set double underscore some name for element. And then it can also have this header search input. 
So the last two here are part of the header search form. And I have a kind of a question for the room on this last guy, on these last two guys. Do you notice anything that's wrong with them? Based off of the conventions of Ben. So again, it says header search input and header search input button. Is there something incorrect with these elements? What? Yeah, so there's that is definitely the huge call out because it's highlighted. And this was actually by by mistake, but it's also another really good call out is it says header search as opposed to header search form. So it should be carrying that all the way down. And in the case that search was its own kind of floating component, I could just have search button. So good responses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it, it's definitely allowed because uh, CSS as a whole is, yeah, well, CSS as a whole is a hyphen delimited language. So the whole syntax for CSS is always lowercase and always dash delimited or hyphen delimited. And that goes for all the properties that are written in CSS. There's never a case where it's not. Some of the weird Microsoft ones with alpha are. And anything that's XHTML is also always lowercase. So when it goes to the naming conventions of CSS and selectors, if you have two words, it's dash base or hyphen separated. And they're always lowercase. And camel casing is not part of the CSS language. And you should always try to keep your variables or variables, selectors, or whatever it is for your language being consistent with the language that you're writing in. Yeah, but I, I can see how it could be confusing because of the dashes inside of BAM for a modifier. And that's why there's actually two dashes as opposed to one dash for a modifier. <laughs> yeah. So, so looking at project assets, uh, and I, I use BAM outside of actually just front-end code and CSS, which is what it was really developed for. And you can apply it to other pieces, which I'll be talking about. It also applies to other languages, except for uh, a lot of like back-end ones. It, you're not allowed to have uh, dashes in it. Even JavaScript doesn't allow you to have it. But if you're using a query selector or jQuery object, you can use it. So I did a presentation. It was about a year and a half ago with an art director when I was at uh, Resource. And those that don't know Resource, it's a digital marketing agency. And we were really looking at best practices, reuse, and uh, performance as a whole and how we could get better. So we did a series that was called BEM for Designers. And we applied the methodology of BEM to design work and how you would actually create assets and design develop them. So again, looking at three entities. For Photoshop, we kind of related block to folder of smart objects. For each individual element, we saw those as layers. So we nested any component underneath a block, which was its layer. And then any modified version or alternate version, we used a modifier and used the same syntax. And the reason why we kind of we thought this was a good naming convention and it kept it clean is we kept seeing more and more projects we were very heavily focused on the creative side. And you'd see a PSD that would have layer 9042. Like literally see that. And you had no idea what that actually meant. 
And as Photoshop has actually progressed, there's ability to search for layers and actually right click and jump from layer to layer. And it just allows you to easily find it. So here's like an example of, and this will probably be hard for you guys to see, but an example of a Photoshop file with using a header example and how we broke that down. So it just gives organization to the code, I mean to the Photoshop file, and it allows your team to be speaking the same language. So again, back to that maybe list that would be existing inside of your header uh, block, the designer could actually break down the, direct, the directory in that way. So we're all communicating the same way. And doing this is really nice because the whole, one of the big points about them is you can look at an individual layer and know where it's kind of nested or lives with inside. And with Photoshop files, especially as they grow and they're passed on from designer to designer, they can get really messy. And this is just a really nice way to organize your Photoshop files for consistent communication. Before you get to the item one. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's the one thing that I don't like actually in that example. And it's just because Photoshop can't anything like that, it should just remain the same and only use it as modifying. And the reason that was one of those back and forth that we were looking at. So we were looking at text as a modified object, when in reality text is just the content and it's not relevant to the naming convention. So looking at file names, like a global header, which when I'm talking about file names, I'm referring to pieces of the master template, pieces that are part of your main site as a whole. Uh, this is not the individual updated daily content. It's things that live long. So logo, think of logo as the main piece here. And the variation of logo would be maybe there's a specific one to the header. Maybe your logo is usually vertical or square, but you have a horizontal one. Here we go. Maybe you have a white version of the logo or a blue version of it. Looking at more module-specific ones, so we have section with some variation of it, so a modified section with featured, and an icon that's an arrow. So an arrow icon that li lives inside the featured section. Uh, as I was talking to actually Nick about this the other day, it's funny when we look at assets, we kind of read them backwards. But by following the conventions of BAM, it also gives you that understanding of where this is. Looking at another example, similar thing, but it has circles. And pretty common ones like photo dash gallery double underscore image. So photo gallery is the module, image is the actual element inside there, and this is some very uh, modified 2x size of it. One thing to call out here is uh, I'm not using the file asset names. That's a huge no when coming, when you're talking about especially global components. Uh, another really awesome part about this whole naming convention is goes going back to like that portability of your code with your assets, say, we're, on pro we're working on a project over here. A couple months later, we realize that same photo gallery or that same piece of functionality, that same module, we can actually use on our other project. All these things are organized next to each other in our assets library. And then all of our code is kind of separated over here and organized the same way. So it becomes a lot easier to move these pieces from one project to another. Because if these were just starting with icon at the beginning, you may be pulling in assets that aren't necessarily related to the photo gallery assets. Same thing with background images. Looking at where they belong and then the name. The body background one is a little bit different than the other conventions. But that's typically how I follow it because I see the body as that overall encompassing piece. And then section featured, background. Looking at something more specific like a video type, these are really basic examples, but section name, file name, and then maybe a modified version of the resolution for it. And again, in your asset library, as you're looking at these, these are all organized next to each other, and it's really easy to see where they relate to.
Yes. So there were a couple questions about like the naming conventions and especially the semantic in semantic callouts and um, the most reusable components are independent from the content that you have in general and that's like one of the basic foundations of object oriented CSS and semantic in semantic naming conventions or best practices when coming to uh, naming conventions so by that, it's like the classes should not necessarily describe the content because it allows for more reusability. By naming something like, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, uh, I don't know, promo, but maybe promo actually just is a property for a rectangular square that has a border around it. I could better use that as calling it some module that's non-specific to promotion or a promo. That was a bad example that I just pulled out of my head. But uh, you're, you should really be focusing on the styling function rather than the content being the function when it comes to naming. So a lot of those examples that I gave, uh, even like the header example, there may be reusable components in the same setups that you'd want to use elsewhere on your site. And by using semantic naming, it kind of loses that point of reuse. So you want to keep them as generic as possible, but keep them in a way that's understandable for other people. I've also seen in code, and if you're using something like SAS, there's an at extend functionality. So you can create your core base selectors that are reusable, and then extend them to a selector that's a little bit more semantic or based around it. A uh, really great example of like true object-oriented CSS is the media object. Is anyone familiar with the media object? So the media object is a block of code that usually contains an image, usually contains a brief description, and some buttons or functionality. Perfect example of it is on the newsfeed and any post that's in your newsfeed. So you see an image of one of your friends, you see their name, you see the date and time when it came, you see a description, you see some buttons to like, reply, or whatever, share. That's a media object. And with a media object, you never really see like news feed, news feed item, news feed item image. It's all based around the idea that this is an object and it's referred to as a media object and those pieces inside of it are not semantic to the context of it being in the newsfeed. And that's one of the most common object-oriented CSS patterns, and you see it a lot in examples with them. So I hope I hit on a lot of benefits as I talked about this throughout, but here's a list of uh, benefits that I kind of want to put out there. So coding consistency and consistency throughout your project. Everything looks like it's just one developer no matter how many people are working on it. There's of course the, the naming convention that's part of BAM, so that keeps everything looking solid. Um, being able to have this evolution of design, and by design I also mean like the development, design, and architecture, back to that human cow turning it back to animal. So being able to be adaptive and flexible on that. Team communication, looking at an image and how we can start naming it, having Photoshop files aligned, having my code be kind of aligned. And we're referring to it as uh, nav link as opposed to that anchor that's inside the header. And someone says, what is that? We actually have a name for it. Uh, multiple developers can also be working because it's all about based around modularity. and making the code be kind of separated out. So I could be working on section A, another developer can be working on section B, and we know we're not going to have any code conflicts because we're inside that naming convention of block uh, element, and two different developers can be working on two different modules at the same time. And we know when we bring the code together, we're not going to have any conflicting classes or selectors. Uh, scalability is kind of like the overall general thing here, but looking at the project and the life of it and how being, you know, jump in a project five months later and kind of quickly look at the code and the selectors and know what they mean in the context of wherever they may live. Code performance, 
talk about CSS selectors, but it's really getting down to each individual element, removing that dependency from the parents and making them just be on the selector itself. Overall, it's better code. Um, and talk about the reuse of pieces. Overall, the last two are uh, about structuring your process. And the biggest probably one out of all of these is the ramp up time reduced. Because if you understand BEM and the principles of it, then if you've never worked with BEM, BEM's an official methodology. There's many places out there where you can look it up. And it's actually very easily, easily explained to someone. But to fully grasp it and understand it, it takes some time or sitting through an hour or so presentation on it. So I put together a cheat sheet. And it's on my website. So it's just bem.nicetransition.com. And inside there, it has this nice little breakdown of block element and the modifiers for it. So didn't print these off, but if you go there, it's a PDF, and you can download it and or just reference it from there. Um, it may be helpful for you just to kind of remember what those pieces are. So just bem.nicetransition.com. So that is it. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the worst and best examples is the header, and I was actually talking to Mario, I think about Mario about this last night, and um, header is one of those specific pieces of functionality, and it's one of those rare examples where it's not reusable, but it's really easy to explain some kind of naming convention. Like I, you see it as the first example for atomic design. You always see it in object-oriented CSS. And it was very easy to do it for BAM. But in reality, it's the worst when you're talking about reuse, portability, and making a module that you can put in other places. And the example that I did for header, because it's just one piece and it was a self-containing to try to you know show the points and the naming convention of BAM, I dove down a little bit deeper. And even in the human animal cow example, dove down deeper, where in reality, I would probably never go down that deep. Because once I go down like those maybe even like two or three levels, I probably have found myself with a sub-module or some kind of module that I have built out so somewhere really else. Not that yeah, yeah. Yeah, for the example of like the nav list, uh, or header nav list, that would probably be its own block that would be like, I don't know, some, some kind of name that would make your list be a horizontal nav, or a nav double dash horizontal. Something like that would be a little bit better than diving down that deep. Okay. And then you could use that in other places of your site, because that is a common pattern. Okay. It's about recognizing patterns. Joel Treadway. Are you talking about CSS as a whole? CSS yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that slide where it was about the CSS three selectors, uh, that article, and I'm trying to think, I could post it on the YouTube page of this or email this group. Uh, actually, goes into the measurement and performance of uh, CSS versus BAM versus the DOM ordering and rendering. So there are measurements on it. IDs as a whole are definitely faster, but you're also going to have more code because IDs aren't reusable. So if I have ID button, yeah, we'll find it quicker, but I'm going to have to have ID button 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, meaning in my code I'm going to have to have five lines or six lines of selectors associated to that style. Yeah. Are there any other big projects you think that use them? I know it's like the Russian example, but it's been more familiar. Um, I'm, I'm yeah. Uh, I see them come up all the time. And a lot of times when you look at like 
large projects, uh, BEM is used. Okay. It's not official. It's not official to the Google coding standards, but you yeah. do see it in the Google uh, code. I, I'm thinking that Twitter actually uses BEM. Okay. Uh, yeah, but if you guys see some really good examples of BEM, please share them with me. Anything else? Sorry. Yeah, I was wondering, is there a change that we made or we made out of just the slide? Yeah, apparently I did not have that.